Hello, elected municipal officials from Pennsylvania. I want to start off my time by giving you an important disclaimer. Self-driving cars and the technology that they bring are almost certainly coming. But that does not mean that they are coming tomorrow. I think it's especially important that those of us who work in downtown Pittsburgh or who frequent downtown Pittsburgh, I think it's especially important that we hear this. And the reason it's so important that we hear this is because we see these Uber self-driving cars flying all over the streets downtown. And we tend to get lulled into this false sense of imminency. And we think that these things are coming on a wide scale immediately. And that is not the case. I want to make sure it's clear that you do not need to go running back to your boards and your councils and schedule a meeting to discuss the clear and present danger of self-driving cars. That's not the case at all. However, sitting in the audience today is George Jones. He is the vice president of the Aleppo Township Board of Commissioners, and he is a master of logistics and operations. Vice President Jones and our ma manager, Manager Patterson, have just finished developing a 10-year road paving plan for Aleppo Township. That means that we have a pretty good idea of where we expect to spend every single one of our road dollars for the next 10 years. And many of the things that we are going to discuss with respect to self-driving cars fit into that exact same 10-year time horizon. So if the needs and expectations of our roads are expected to change significantly in the same 10 years as our 10-year road paving plan, doesn't it make sense that we at least think about those issues? I mean, let me say that a little bit differently and perhaps a little more pointedly. Are we honoring the commitment to the public trust that has been placed in us if we don't educate ourselves about these issues. You may think that self-driving cars won't be here in your lifetime. And you may be resistant to accept changing technology. But hear me now and believe me later. This stuff is coming and it will affect your municipality. This is a slide from a presentation that PennDOT gave on self-driving cars over the summer at a conference in Philadelphia. It gives you an idea of when all of these manufacturers accept having mainstream models of autonomous cars available for sale. And you see that the farthest one out is Audi in 2035. So if we accept that as our most conservative far end of the spectrum, 2035 is the year to hang on to. So the expression is forewarned is forearmed. The whole purpose of conferences like this are for us to discuss emerging issues and for you to hear about them and think about them before they surprise you. But nothing we discuss here today should make you hit the alarm button. Now it's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse to explain the technology of self-driving cars to you, but to discuss the implications of this development on municipal governments, it's important for you to have a working knowledge of some of the technical terms. So I want to play this video for you. This is a video 
that PennDOT produced for an autonomous vehicle summit that they held in State College a few weeks ago. And they've given me permission to show this video to you. It does a good job of explaining some of the basics of the technology. So let me just take a few minutes now and show you this video. Transportation officials, advocates, companies, and users around the world are talking about how automated vehicles will change transportation as we know it. But what exactly are automated vehicles? There are two types of automated vehicles, autonomous vehicles, or AV, and connected automated vehicles, or CAV. An autonomous vehicle is a vehicle that relies entirely on its own onboard sensors for exercising vehicle control functions and maintaining situational awareness. A connected automated vehicle is an automated vehicle that has capabilities that allow it to be aware of other equipped vehicles in their immediate vicinity. It is also aware of the specific features of the surrounding infrastructure, such as intersections and curves. There are quite a few advantages to automated technologies. Safety. Driver actions account for more than 90% of motor vehicle crashes nationwide. Automated technologies minimize and can potentially remove human error behind the wheel, resulting in fewer crashes and fatalities. Mobility. Automated vehicle technology could result in greater efficiency and a dramatic reduction in congestion without the need for capacity. In Pennsylvania, congestion results in more than 264 million hours of delay each year. Land use. In an automated future, a vehicle could drop off one person, then pick up someone else and be in almost constant use. That's unlike our current vehicles that sit idle for an average of 22 hours a day. In fact, some parking lots and garages could eventually be repurposed into green space. And society. Mature drivers and people with disabilities will be able to enjoy new transportation options and independence. In Pennsylvania alone, there are over 950,000 disabled citizens. Autonomous vehicles are split into six levels of automation as defined by the Society of Automotive Engineers. Zero, no automation. One, driver assistance. Two, partial automation. Three, conditional automation. Four, high automation. And five, full automation. Humans are responsible for motoring the vehicle and performing most functions in levels one and two, while an automated driving system performs all functions in levels three, four, and five. Vehicles in levels three and up are considered highly automated vehicles. As vehicles progress to higher levels of automation, less responsibility is put on the driver for monitoring the vehicle. Here's how an automated vehicle works. Several systems work in conjunction with each other to control an automated vehicle. Radar sensors dotted around the car monitor the position of vehicles nearby. Video cameras detect traffic lights read road signs and keep track of other vehicles while also looking out for pedestrians and other obstacles. Light detection and ranging sensors, that is LIDAR sensors, help to detect the edges of roads and identify lane markings by bouncing pulses of light off the car's surroundings. Ultrasonic sensors in the wheels can detect the position of curbs and other vehicles when parking. Finally, a central computer analyzes all the data from the various sensors to manipulate the steering, acceleration, and braking. Here's how connected technologies work. Connected vehicles are vehicles that use many different communication technologies to communicate with the driver, with other cars on the road, that is vehicle-to-vehicle, -vehicle, or V2V, with roadside infrastructure, vehicle-to-infrastructure, or V2I, and with the cloud. This technology can be used to not only improve vehicle safety, but also to improve vehicle efficiency and commute times. With these technologies entering the transportation landscape, many stakeholders are looking at how to prepare. Pennsylvania and PennDOT, the State Department of Transportation, have been established as leaders in the realm of automated vehicles. The Pennsylvania Department of Transportation established the Pennsylvania Autonomous Vehicle Policy Task Force in June of 2016. The task force consists of government, academia, advocacy, and industry representatives. 
After several meetings and reviewing standards and feedback, the task force shared its final recommended testing guidance in December 2016. PennDOT and other task force members will continue to work with officials at all levels as guidance from policy and relevant legislation are implemented. The future is bright and it's very bright here in Pennsylvania. And we are intent on playing a major role in moving this very innovative technology forward. These technologies will impact mobility not just in Pennsylvania, but also across the globe. We all have a role in preparing our communities for these monumental developments, and we welcome you to join us for this world-changing transportation evolution. All right, so with a little bit of understanding under your belt about how this technology works, let me start by talking to you about the legal framework for the regulation of self-driving cars. And actually, this pyramid slide, it's just up here as a joke, uh, because right now the bottom line is that there are no laws or rules governing self-driving cars. Earlier this month, the federal government issued a Department of Transportation policy concerning self-driving cars, and obviously, this is the policy of the Trump administration. Not surprisingly, it rolled back many of the policies that were issued only last year under the Obama administration. And I am not here to talk about politics. I'm not here to make this about a good guy and a bad guy. I only bring this up by way of telling you that as quickly as the administration changes, the politics change and the policies change. So policies that we had last year at this same time, they're already out the window and they're being replaced with entirely new policies. The Trump policy takes a different approach, much of which is far more business friendly and it takes regulation that was going to be in the hands of the states and it puts it in the control of the federal government. Again, this is a policy only it is not a binding law or a regulation, but it sets a tone of easing the process for companies to manufacture, test, and deploy self-driving cars. And I'll talk in just a minute about uh, the, the other view of that. Um, as far as actual federal legislation goes, there is a bill that's called the Self-Drive Act that passed the House earlier this month. For those of you who track bills and get email reminders about them. This is HR 3388, if you wanna keep an eye on where that's going. Uh, it's been received in the Senate and referred to the Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, and it very much uh, mirrors the Trump policy that we talked about just a minute ago. Here in Pennsylvania, the legislation you should be aware of is Senate Bill 427. This is a bill that's issued by State Senator Vlakovich with a number of other co-sponsors and there is a companion bill in the House. So I know lots of you are represented by State Senator Vlakovich. You might wanna to talk to him about this and get his view on it. This bill was introduced in February and it hasn't really gone anywhere since then. In part because there are so many different interests jockeying for legislative preference. So on the one hand of this debate, Industry says that if there are regulations in place, Pennsylvania won't be a favorable testing ground. And you're gonna chase out the Ubers and the companies that wanna be doing testing here. On the other hand, some people say that if there aren't firm regulations in place, safety will be at risk. So we can't let these industries go unchecked and they need to be regulated even in the testing period. So between those two different interests, it's stalemated. I suspect, without knowing this for certain, that not knowing what's going on in the federal government also contributes to its stalemate. That back when this was introduced, we were still living under the Obama policy where a fair amount was still gonna be in the hands of the states. And now we see the Trump policy that's gonna put much more of that in the hands of the federal government. So. It's really not clear, SB 427 is really just sort of sitting around. Now, what will happen with all of this? Really, who knows? 
And it doesn't really matter where we, we come out with all of this. Again, Trump's policy certainly seems to indicate that he's gonna come down on the side of making it easier for manufacturers to get these cars on the road, which some critics say comes at the expense of safety. But it really doesn't matter because of preemption. Regardless of whether self-driving cars are regulated at the state or the federal level, one thing I can tell all of you for certain is that you will not need to be passing ordinances that regulate self-driving cars. And the reason that you won't be passing ordinances is because of preemption. In the same way that you can't pass an ordinance that regulates firearms because that's dealt with at the state level, you won't be able to pass ordinances that deal with self-driving cars because that will either be done at the state or the federal level. All right, so what are some of the areas where the future of transportation may affect you? Well, like so much else, it really comes down to one thing, right? It comes down to money. Now, as soon as I mention that word money, I want to go back to my disclaimer and caution you that I don't want you to hear that this technology is going to impact your budgets and all of a sudden make you be somebody that says no to self-driving cars. That's the last thing that I want to do. As that video said, self-driving cars promise to reduce traffic fatalities by 92%. 92%. That number is huge. If we can significantly improve road safety, we have to do that. If we can eliminate drunk driving, we have to do that. If we can increase the mobility of seniors and handicapped drivers, we have to do that. We cannot sit here and say that we don't want to do that simply because it's going to have an impact on our budget. We have to take these things on and be ready for it. But the truth is that self-driving cars will have impacts on both the expense and the revenue side of your municipal budget. And I want to start with a concept that I know is going to get a reaction from lots of you, including my co-presenter. It's the concept of revenue from speeding enforcement. Now, I know what lots of you are gonna say. First of all, you're gonna take issue with the fact that I've put a picture of a radar gun up here, and you're gonna tell me that our local police departments aren't allowed to use radar guns. I know that, okay? Let's just agree that the image up here is a bit of artistic liberty. Uh, let's look past that technical issue, and let's reaffirm our support of Senate Bill 251 that would allow our local police departments to use radar. Let's get past that, okay? The bigger issue that you're gonna say to me is, aha, but you can't make money from speeding. That's what you're gonna say to me. You can't make money from speeding. And I don't even need to touch on that issue, okay? If, if you're asserting that you can't make money on speeding, fine, I'll let you keep that assertion. But the reason I don't need to get to that is because when you make this argument that you can't make money from speeding, what you're really talking about is a question of profit. And I'm talking about revenue. There is no question that speeding enforcement generates revenue. Now, it may be offset by an immediate expense to the court. It may be offset by an immediate expense in overtime. It may be offset by an ex immediate salary expense. So there may be all these expenses that offset the revenue that make it so that you can't profit from it. But there's no question that it raises revenue that you book on your balance sheets. 
And while you may think that that is a distinction without a difference, think about the implications of not having that revenue. Because the bottom line is that it means that there is less for your police departments to do. I mean, here's the setup. Self-driving cars don't speed. They promise 92% reduction in traffic fatalities. One of the reasons that they promise such striking numbers is because they do not speed. Those of us who do work in downtown Pittsburgh, we all know that getting stuck behind an Uber self-driving car is the new version of getting stuck behind the bus. They are slow, they lumber along, and they follow all of the traffic regulations. When this technology is fully realized, it's not just speeding, but pretty much all traffic enforcement that will be eliminated from the service that your municipality and your police departments provide. There will be significantly less work for your officers to do. So maybe don't think about it from a revenue perspective. Maybe think about it from a personnel perspective. Will you need the same size police force that you have now? Will you have the same pension obligations that you face now? You may very well be in a situation where you have a significant number of displaced workers. You know, union leaders comment about self-driving technology raising concerns that it could eliminate up to 40 million jobs in the trucking sector, in the hospitality sector. One impact that self-driving technology will definitely have is on labor and personnel. And don't let a question of profiting from speeding enforcement versus revenue from speeding enforcement make you lose sight of the implications that this may very well have on your operations and your budget. Another really similar, really timely issue is the question of parking revenue. Self-driving cars do not have the same parking needs as the cars we drive today do. Even if self-driving cars do need to park, they're not going to park in the same parking spots that we have designated now, which are in the middle of our business districts in really high rent areas. Think about it. The parking garages and parking lots that you have in the middle of your business districts, that is really sought after real estate. And you've dedicated it to parking because people want to be able to get to the stores and restaurants that they're going to quickly. But self-driving cars, even if they need some place to stop, they won't be doing that in these very high desired areas. They're going to go out to depots that are built in fields because they can drive themselves there far away. Think industrial parks on the outskirts. They're not going to be in the middle of your business districts. So there's a really no question that the future of transportation involves significantly altered streams of parking revenue. And if we take the city of Pittsburgh as a meter stick for the rest of our municipal budgets, in April, the New York Times reported that 15% of the city of Pittsburgh's budget was generated from parking revenue. 15%. Percent. That is a huge number to just have disappear. So this is an issue that we need to stay on top of. And I want to give you an example to try to make this real. The town next to ours is the borough of Sewickley. Now, a new movie theater recently opened in Sewickley, and their business district is thriving. They're really lucky because they've got people coming to the movie theater. Those people go and they eat at restaurants. They might shop at the stores a little bit. But all of those 
moviegoers, diners, and shoppers, they all bring their cars to downtown Sewickley. And so Sewickley is dogged by repeated insistence right now that they build a municipal parking garage. Now think about this. One common way to structure the funding of a parking garage is as a self-liquidating loan. So what happens if you build a parking garage in 2017 and self-driving cars hit the mainstream market by when? 2027? 2035? Remember this slide with the time horizon where we talked about the long term was 2035? So what happens if you build a self-driving car today in 2017 and by 2035 self-driving cars are mainstream? All of a sudden, you've got 15 years left on a loan for an asset that is no longer generating cash. So, what is Sewickley supposed to do? Not build the garage now? Just live with the present shortage of parking? I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have answers to these questions. And I've gone to Swickley Parking Authority's meetings, and I don't know what to say to them or whether to say it at all. Because I know that this is an issue, and when we go to the Autonomous Vehicle Summit, other people agree that this is a real issue. People in the know about autonomous vehicles, they think it's a real issue. But I know if I raise my hand at that parking authority meeting and I say, well, have you thought about the impact of self-driving cars on this decision that you're making? People are going to look at me as if I have two heads. And I know that if you take this message back to your meetings and your councils and your boards, they're going to say the same thing. They're going to look at you as if you have two heads as if you're talking about Jefferson things. I'm just trying to tell you that these issues need to be discussed. Another example is that the local school district in our municipality, Quaker Valley School District, they are in the process where they're considering building a new high school. And obviously, one of the big issues when you build a new high school is parking. And in that conversation, I've actually heard self-driving cars be brought up. But you need to think about these issues as you're building parking facilities, as you're building schools, as you're making improvements to your business districts. You need to be asking yourself and you need to be asking at these meetings, is there an implication with respect to self-driving cars? Because it is not so far off that you shouldn't be thinking about it. All right, last point. I told you we were gonna be talking at decreases in revenue as well as increases in expenses. Now, I'm not gonna get all into the technology of how self-driving cars operate, but remember what they said in the video. They said that LiDAR detectors bounce light off of the surrounding areas around the car and they read lines, okay? One way, and it's the simplest way for these cars to work, is to read the road lines. In the more complex way for these cars to work, they actually read sensors that are embedded into the pavement and the guardrails and the signs. So the more complicated way requires a significant infrastructure investment and a significant expense. I'm talking about the least expensive way. The least expensive way reads the lines on the road. So ask yourself this question. How many of you have crisp lines painted on your roads that could be read by a self-driving car and how many of you have a significantly worse scenario ladies and gentlemen some people say it will cost b b b billions of dollars to retrofit the nation's roads with what it will take for self-driving cars to work. So ask yourself, who's going to pay for that? Because I think there are really only three options. I think if you think about it objectively and you write them down, there are only three options. Who's going to pay to retrofit the roads? Number one is the private industry, Uber and GM 
and all those companies who are out there developing this technology, they'll pay to implement it. That's option number one. Option number two is that the federal government and the state government will pay for it. They're the ones that are making the rules. They're the ones that are making the laws. So they'll pay to implement them. And the number three option is that the local governments will pay for it. Now, I don't need to editorialize and tell you who I think is going to end up paying for this. Because I don't even know if I'm right or not. I'll leave that up to you. But here's my point. You need to be thinking about this question because it is an expense that is coming. And I promise you, the other two options on this list are already thinking about this question. Private industry and the state and federal government are already having conversations about how repainting lines is going to be paid for, about how making sure that the pavement on roads is taken care of, about whether we're going to use more advanced technological infrastructure. They are sitting in conferences and meeting rooms just like the one you're in today, and they are asking questions about who's going to pay for it. So if you are not asking those same questions, you are the only potential stakeholder who is not sitting down at the bargaining table. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am not ashamed to finish my presentation by pandering to your emotions in closing with a pretty picture of a sunrise. Because this really is the dawn of a new era. I heard an NPR piece the other day that said, self-driving cars are going to be the biggest technological change to affect humanity ever. Bigger than the printing press. Bigger than the car really was in the early 1900s. Bigger than the internet. Now, I don't know if I go that far, but we don't need to go that far to be able to say that we are standing on the dawn of a new era. And that is not just fancy speaking. The promise of 92% reduction in traffic fatalities is not empty. The promise of eliminating drunk driving is not empty. And the promise of giving newfound mobility to our seniors and our handicapped residents is not empty. But the work is going to take work. This is going to require effort. So what I ask you as you leave this conference today, I ask you not to shy away from these questions when they come up. Don't bristle back and say, self-driving cars won't happen in my lifetime. Don't bristle back and say, that's too technological for me to deal with. Don't say that. Welcome it and bring it on. Because for many of us, this has the potential to be the most significant municipal issue we confront in our public service careers. So we should grab it by the horns and make sure we're taking an active role in shepherding its arrival. Thank you.